Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. This is a short-term rental alert. If you're interested in short-term rentals, this show is for you. Kenny Bedwell, the founder of strinsights.com, is about to unload all of the secrets. All of the short-term rental insights you can handle are coming at you very, very shortly. Before we get there, I just want to remind you that we have 10-minute clips of every show on my YouTube at Jonathan Green RE, and they come out 10 days after the show airs. So after you listen to the podcast, what is great, you can hop over onto the YouTube a little bit later, watch the video, put faces to the names for both of us or all of us on the show, and then go back, listen to the episode again. I mean, you can do it in whatever order you want. I just want to remind you there is a way to see the show, see us. There's also full episodes available. I hope you go there. And I can't wait for you to hear this show. This is it for STR. Let's go. This is episode 116 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Kenny Bedwell. Kenny is a short-term real estate manager and owner from the Buffalo area, but he just told me he's currently in Destin. He's probably in a short-term rental because Kenny (laughs) is the founder of STR Insights and also the co-host with Bill Faith of STRonomics. Kenny, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, I am in a short term rental. Of course, I got to, you know, I got to live up the uh, persona of, you know, being in a short, the short term rental industry and staying in short term rentals. I got to stay true to that. <laughs> yeah, well, so we could just start with that with your data insights, you probably are able to find the best place at the best price in the best market. So you always know where to go. Am I right? Yes, you are. Right. Actually, this is a funny story. Bear with me, okay? On yeah. this. So this place is actually one of my good friends who owns in uh, Destin. And, you know, I came to him. And so I live in Buffalo, and it's January. And <laughs> we know what happens in Buffalo in January. <laughs> so yeah. I, I see 60 to, inches of snow if you don't know exactly yeah. exactly and I'm just like, I'm, I'm done with that. So we, we want to go to Destin. We love we love to come to Destin for a month. Yeah. And to get away. And so I told my friend, I was like, Hey, you know, what's your place? How much? And we're friends. So he's kind of like, like, I, I, I'm going to pay him. But at the same yeah. time, he's like, well, how much do you think I could get? You know, like he was kind of asking, we were going back and forth. And that's where the data side came out. I was like, let me just look it up and see how much, you know, other properties are charging and what they're making in January. And then I was able to kind of give them like a fair asking. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So we'll go for at the end of the day. You can't argue with the numbers. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll get into your whole background and how you brought it to STR. But I, I remember back in the day, specific to Florida, I used to travel with my dad. We would be in what was at the time timeshares, and then they upgraded to short term rentals. But there was no data at that time. So you really just paid what you paid and you would go back to the same places. What year did the data really become this important to do something like you guys do at STR Insights now? Oh, what year? I mean, I I think we started seeing like the first like true data analytics come out and maybe like 2015, 2014 even. And then it really just started to kind of blossom from there. So. All right. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's drop back in your history. Uh, when you were younger, like you know, under eighteen, were you interested in real estate at all? Under eighteen, interested in yeah. real estate. You know, so the short answer is was no, and the reason why is just because my family doesn't invest in real estate. They just it's the traditional line of thought: get a job, build a four hundred one k, put as much money as you can in the four hundred one k. And, you know, retire early. My grandpa did that. My dad did that. And that was kind of the, you know, just what I was taught and growing up to, you know, that 
that mindset to do. And so that's kind of, it wasn't until actually when I was in college that I started to go like, what's, you know, what, what can real estate really do? <laughs> so. Yeah. I always ask because I feel like somebody now, like with the mind that you have for real estate, what if you did know, you know, in ninth grade or something, it just seems like there's so many kids pre- that are in high school, yeah. or elementary school, who might really be interested in real estate earlier than people think. I'm, I'm trying to expose that because now you know how interesting it is. But like, imagine yourself in high school, you know, if you're a data person, which I know you are, right. and I am, I used to do basketball, baseball statistics, I was obsessed, but I could see myself getting obs- obsessed with like short term rental statistics and, and geographic markets at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and honestly, when I was in college, I noticed this, this is how I got interested in real estate. It wasn't from other people talking about it. It was actually from the data. I was noticing mm. a trend. I did a research project on housing prices in Denver, Colorado. And like I could predict the price of a house in relationship to the proximity to the mountains. So the closer to the mountains, the increase in prices of the houses, which, you know, makes sense. But the fact that I was able to be with like, within like 5%, I had this model I built. And I thought that was so fascinating. And like, uh, and I remember um, my family was living there at the time, and they were moving, they were moving closer to the mountains. And I was like, well, what are you going to buy? And I knew exactly like the price range that we're going to have to be in. You know, yeah. not, not the town didn't matter. Just my, my model didn't care about that. It was the proximity. And so, and it turned out to be within that range. And I was like, I felt so good. And I was like, maybe, maybe I can figure out more stuff with this. And that's kind of how yeah. it just grew, you know? Did you think at that time, I know you like the data, but did you think at that time you were going to become an investor? Or were you strictly thinking this data looks like something that could be cool later? But obviously you were helping your parents with, with the price point yeah. estimate. As an for an investor, I mean, I think that's really where it piqued my interest. It's like, well, if I could predict kind of pricing and you know other benefits of investing, it wasn't even short term yeah. investing at the time. Um, it was just investing in general. I was like, well, what else can I do with this to you know and use this for my benefit beyond just like, oh, this is a fun fact. <laughs> so, yeah, right. you know. Yeah, well, so. what what you do is a perfect example of something I always talk about that insider training in real estate is okay. It, it's mm-hmm. allowed. If you've garnered all this knowledge about short-term rentals and how they work and where the prices are best, you can use it to your advantage. And yeah. others can too by using SDR Insights, right? That's why you created it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's and and uh, I mean that's yeah, that's really the the purpose and the the kind of the origin story of SDR Insights is it was to like it was something I created for myself to find more short-term rental properties yeah. and shared it with other people who were like, this needs to be more public, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. That's funny. That's the the story of David Lecko from Deal Machine is exactly the same. He was just creating an app because he wanted to find off market properties. Right. I mean, and you're doing the same. You're like, I want to use this. And then you realize, how did you realize that other people could then benefit so much from it? Was it you showed it to a couple of people? How did it go from that to where you are now? Yeah. So I joined a mastermind, Bill Face Mastermind years ago. And I was in that mastermind and I had kind of created these spreadsheets and being around the right people yeah, is really motivating and also helpful. And, it, and in this case, it was perfect because I was able to take it to them. And it wasn't, like I said, my vision for this wasn't to turn it into some company and sell it and make money. The vision was just, hey, I want to buy some more properties that fit my criteria, <laughs> my budget, my not, you know, all this stuff. And where can I even go? And I, I was able to do it. And then I took it to other people. I'm like, do you guys like, do you think this is interesting, like helpful for you? And they're like, oh, I need this information. And then they go <laughs> and do it. And they're like, Kenny, like this, like other people need this, you know? And I'm like, I wasn't even thinking like that. I, you know, I wasn't even thinking like that. I was thinking yeah. more like, okay, like, is this helpful for anybody, you know? So that's really, yeah. I mean, that's the, that that's the beauty of it. And then now I'm like in a running a startup <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's fun <laughs> we'll we'll wrap back around to that when and how did you get your first investment property so i actually got my first investment property in in 2018 it was a long-term rental in uh so i live in buffalo i'm not from buffalo but i had moved there at the end of 2017 and so i got my first property in 2018 and it was a duplex and i was going to house hack 
I showed up to all the like REI meetings, you know, with all the old geezers. <laughs> There's like, a lot in Buffalo. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, this is what I want to do, you know, because I, I was interested in real estate investing and, you know, listen to Bigger Pocket, just doing all, you know, the typical stuff. And, and I, I you know, I was kind of like, this is a little boring. Like it, it was good, but I was like, I want to do this. But like hearing some of the stories of long term rentals, I was like, man, this all right. Like, I, yeah, it sounds interesting enough. Like it sounds better than my job, but like, yeah, it's kind of boring. Like I see this more, you know, just more passive and how to get into it. And I met this guy, this was really interesting. So I met this guy at the, the event and he was just like, kind of had this energy about him yeah. and, he, and he was talking about Airbnbs and this is in 2018. So not relatively new. Like I had actually stayed in them, used them before, but he was talking about Airbnbs. He's like, you got to do this. Just, just put your property up and see what it does. And I, and so I looked into it and I was like, okay, sure. I could try it. And worst case scenario, I just rent out this property right. like I was going to and whatever. And it just started making money. And I was like, this is like, what, what is this? You know? And I started, yeah. you know, I was like, let me go get another one. I did another one in a better location and made even more money. And I was like, Hey, I think I'm on to something here. Were you, know, were, uh, really, were you doing both units or just one long-term and one short-term in the duplex? I did both. I did both short-term. Yeah. So then you could compare what the annual rent would have been versus your, you know, STR return. And that's when you were like, okay, <laughs> yeah, this is pretty awesome. Yeah. No, I, I mean, like when I was making like, I mean, I was making two to three X depending on the yeah. month, you know, and I'm like, which is really what you should shoot for for short term rentals anyway. But I I'm agree. like, holy cow, like this is just, this is so much better. And yeah, I don't and have these like horror stories of, oh, you know, like tenants breaking things and doing stuff. <laughs> right. So, and P.S., you, you were in Buffalo. Now, yeah. Buffalo is a great area, but it's not it's it's like a winter trouble zone. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not like you're right on the beach or something. So no. because I think as STRs have grown, people now understand for people like me, I, I don't stay in hotels. I only I've stayed in short term rentals for 20 years. I just I like having breakfast. I want a refrigerator. I want to do laundry with kids and all that. But I think the perception is still that you need to be in like a vacation friendly market. And mm -hmm. I don't think you would call that Buffalo. Of course, there's lakes and stuff around. But this is interesting that you were learning all this stuff before all this happened. Where did you go? So you had two duplexes at one time and they were all being short term rental. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we did that and then we did a triplex near Niagara Falls because we're right near Niagara Falls. And so, yeah. So that was like kind of the, the third one we got into. And that one really started to, you know, we, well, and like that, that one is destination based. So that was, you were thinking we can make more closer to Niagara Falls for tourism. That's when I started applying my data side and I started doing research and I was like, Hmm, okay, now like I'm not just guessing and going, okay, I hope this makes money. If it doesn't, I'm going to bail out and long term rent. It was changed from I'm going to be strategic about this and actually find a property based on the short term rental revenue of what it can earn. And so I, I bought a $250,000 triplex in Niagara Falls. They those do exist. Yeah. Some still today. So, and it was generating over $100,000 <laughs> in gross income. Yeah. So, I mean, that just kind of grew and, and helped me really try to, you know, like, okay, wow, I can do this. I can apply my skills and, and have fun and then make some money and invest. <laughs> so, yeah. I know we're, we're going to get into the data side, but how was it learning to be a manager of short term rentals on those first seven units? Because, it, you know, management's not for everybody in short term. No. You have to be good at it in order to keep the flow and the trajectory of the units going up. Because if you, you know, you get a few bad reviews, the algorithm just says good night to you. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there's a joke. It's, uh, do you know where the best place to hide a dead body is? Oh, I, I, I'm going to oh. like it. Can't tell me. On the last page of Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And definitely true. No yeah, one's ever yeah. going to look there. Exactly. No one's going to look there. So anyway, so yeah, you're absolutely right. So hosting is, is really key. Once again, I was early enough in the industry where, and then I was joining groups. I was surrounding myself by other hosts who were, who were better and I learned from them. And so I was able to just rise straight to the top through the right messaging, knew the right amenities, just ways to handle situations, automations, and like st just staying on front with technology. I mean, technology is a lifesaver. When I automated my messaging, that was huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like just little things like that keep you on the forefront. And like, I, I, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, another host, 
And they were asking me, they're like, well, how do you deal with it? Like you have SDR insights, you've got all these other like weird businesses and stuff that you do and you still manage properties and you won't hire a property manager. I was like, yeah, I don't need to because I have technology. And they're like, well, how do you deal with guests when they ask you questions? I was like, sometimes I don't even talk to my guests. And they'll yeah. give me a review and they're like, excellent communication. He checked in on me all the time. It was all automated, you yeah, know, yeah. But there were no issues. Now they do send me something. I can see it, but like, I really don't interact that often with my guests and I still have really high reviews. Now I'm not the best of the best. I'm not going to lie there, but it's not my zone of genius, but I'm still pretty good at it. And it is required to get in this industry. We have to be hospitable. Yeah, those are great points. And I think it shows that most of the questions are repetitive. So once you get the question once or twice, then you automate the answer. So you know when to send it back and click a button because everyone ends up. And then a lot of times I found because we were doing short term rentals as as landlord owners 20, 25 years ago when they were just really starting and it was just home away and Verbo. And every time we would get a question a second time, we were like, oh, that needs to be in the description. Mm -hmm. So the more that we would add to the description, the less questions that we would get later. And the more tuned up our descriptions were in our kind of extras, you know, here's you're going to get a guide. Have you found that over the time? It th uh, Definitely the best photos are leading and the best stays, but it comes with the best description because that takes the guesswork away. And the guesswork is where the bad reviews come from. Yeah. So once I implemented, I think the best thing for me was in doing like a guidebook, a virtual guidebook. Yeah, I that agree. I yeah they're great. And I could put in videos, you know, and so people are like, well, how do I, you know, do this? I'm like, oh, go to page five of the guidebook, you know, and they just watch a video. Hey, yeah. it's me. I'm going to show you yeah. how to turn on the hot tub, you know, or like whatever. And so that was a, a game changer or like, oh, like just random stuff like, oh, the the circuits, you know, the circuit breaker. Pop. <laughs> like, where do I go there, you know, to, to redo the circuit breaker? Oh, it's down here. And like, I have a video of like me showing them how to do it, you know, and literally like someone told me they're like hey i was gonna message you but then i saw that video and it just i didn't need to i'd appreciate that and i was like yes <laughs> i never thought i know it's funny i never thought of that because i do videos for so many other things now but i don't have any active short terms now but back in the day we used to have a very you know a very good guidebook but yeah no no pictures and i can imagine because all of us who've done short-term rentals know the questions that come up tv remotes it's like how can you not work a tv remote but if they yeah. saw you you know the one where you go in and there's four remotes and you're like couldn't have you just made it one yeah. remote this is too tricky i'm never gonna get it but it's those things like where's the you know where's the detergent oh it's in that weird closet above that doesn't look like it's there you have to know your property well and then i, I really love those tips i've never heard that on this show so i hope people take that if you're the owner and you're making videos and showing them, you're making a connection too, which will then also help your reviews later without having to do anything. You know, you, you like we were saying before, you're not doing that message. You've already pre-recorded an obvious answer to a question. They can watch a video, connect with you one-to-one. -one. I, I think that's great. And I've, you've gotten good feedback on that, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know some hosts will take you the next step. So Bill Faith, one of my mentors for the short-term rental space, he will, um, on some of his luxury properties, he'll just record a quick video, you know, hey, so-and-so want to welcome you, you know, to the place or whatever and send it to him right before their stay. It just adds that like human element to it. So people feel like, oh yeah, like I'm actually being hosted by someone and not, yeah. you know, a management company, which a lot of people are kind of like, you know, expect, but look down upon. So yeah. I think it's even more important because like I, I'm a I'm very much an introvert. I don't want the host to meet me at the property. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. I feel like they're like checking me out. But if I had a video, I would feel very connected to the host and know I could call them. But without having that weird thing where they show you around the house and you're like, I, I mean, I know where the bathroom is. I see it. It's, it's right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, they want exactly. that's like the over hospitality portion right. that they haven't got to modern hospitality. Would, right. would you consider short-term rentals as a whole decidedly a hospitality business and not a real estate business? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to own a short-term rental and manage the property yourself, you it, it, it's hospitality. You're in an yeah. active business. It's not passive income. A lot of people think, you know, even oh, I hear, God, I, no. see the, <laughs> I see the ads on social media, like, you know, leave your nine to five and pass it. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what is this? Like, what, like, yeah, no, it's that's. I it's mean, not, just in, yeah, in general, landlording is like the least passive business in any kind. Right. And short term, you're just doing it instead of one time a year, you're just going to do it three times a week with new people asking. You questions. Right. <laughs> Exactly. So definitely. Yeah. So and then there has to be a hospitality element. But look, like, 
for people who are like, well, I don't want to deal with people. I don't want to deal with guests. Yes, you can have people manage your property for you. And you don't have to hire the big, you know, yeah. chain management companies. You can hire co-hosts and people who love the management side and do that. Just know that it costs a little bit more than uh, typical. Yeah. I think it's costs. worth it, though. When I'm looking, I look for the super hosts in the area. And then I look through which other places they host to see in my head if I think, do they own them? Or are they a good host? They always have their systems lined up. And like I said, I don't want to interact with them. I just want to go and have everything be where it was. It's like a, for me to have to ask something I'll do anything not to have to, you know, ask. And I did have to ask once because me, who's super techie, could not turn on the TV. Like, these yeah. are the things that they should have thought of that I know is going to be an issue. Hey, this is Jonathan. Thanks for listening to another episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. On this brief interlude, I wanted to tell you that we have a mailing list. I actually don't love mailing lists. There's so much. This is not an automated mailing list where you get on a drip campaign. These are written once a month. will eventually be at once a week again by me direct, and they're not spammy. So if you want to sign up for our mailing list, you can go to bit.ly slash streamlined with a D mail. Bit.ly is B-I-T dot L-Y slash streamlined mail. See you there. So well, let me ask you this. If you if you could pick, we'll get into all the data points, but if you could just pick one point of data that would help someone the most in determining maybe, I guess, where they should invest for short-term rental, what would it be? And if it's not one, it's okay. But what's the like one thing that kind of is the main, main focus that the other things come off of? Oh, boy. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Maybe what? it's more. Let me, yeah. Okay. So the way I teach people for finding investable markets, so... I can't give you a one answer. I can give you a, a yeah. five. And let me give you five yeah, key points here that I, I I look at. There's there's a lot of metrics. There's a lot of different things to look at. But these are the five key ones. I call them the, the five key steps or whatever. But So the first one is affordability. Can you afford to be in that market? Okay. The second one is what can you afford in that market? So the type of property, the bedroom count, the size of the property, and so on. You know, for example, in Destin, Florida... You know, these properties are really expensive. If my budget was five hundred thousand, I'm buying a condo. Do I want a yeah. condo? You know, if I want a single family home, like I need to look in other places. The third data point is the number of short term rentals in that market. Okay. That's in relation to yeah. saturation and also in terms of resource accessibility. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and there's only five properties, like do you think you're gonna have good cleaners and maintenance people? Yeah. You know, whereas like if you're in a market where there's thousands of like, well you know of the same type of property i'm thinking like yeah. semi you know the neighborhoods are all pretty much the same it gets a lot more competitive it gets a lot harder so the number of short-term rentals matters and we have like kind of a preference there a fourth one and this is a big one is regulation yeah of course there, there's a lot of cities and towns and stuff that are just banning short-term rentals or capping them or limiting what they can do and so it's really important before you go into a market to make sure that the regulation is relatively friendly permits okay things like that are okay and the yeah. fifth and the most important one is revenue are there properties that are going to generate the income that my goals are set at so if i want a property to make a hundred thousand dollars are there properties making a hundred thousand dollars there so those yeah. are the five kind of things that i look at to know if a market is is generally investable for me yeah those are great and i think in the restrictions area in terms of regulation i would also look in my head, I think historically, because there are towns that have always been short term rental friendly, that's mm -hmm. very unlikely to change. They operate on a short term tourism budget like Correct. they used to in terms of timeshares and things like that. That's why a lot of towns in Florida are STR friendly. But mm -hmm. knowing up front, if you see any regulations that they're pushing back against it, that's not good for the future. <laughs> Because something's pushing that way, whereas you could go to markets where they're like, no, this is this is what we do. You, you want to you. You want to invest in markets that have at least two to three major traffic drivers there to incentivize travel, you know? Yeah. So, like, when I think of Buffalo, like, we have Niagara Falls, which is, you know, 20 minutes away. You know, we've got – this is more of a city market. So, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like, you got the universities. You've got the hospitals. Yeah, sports team, though, too. Sports, sports team's team, yeah. big for short term. Oh, exactly. Like, when the Bills are in the playoffs, like, we're, you know, Huge. for the games they were. <laughs> they're, like, yeah. we, you know – 
you know, and then there's, there's, there's sport, there's actually sports year round. There's hockey and there's baseball yeah. and there's all these stuff. There's so much stuff going on. It's an urban market. I, I'm also in a lake market too. And, you know, it's not just the, so it's in Watkins Glen, New York and the Finger mm-hmm. Lakes. There's a state park there. There's obviously a lake. There's wineries. So there's yeah. seasons. And there's also a, a NASCAR stadium there. <laughs> so wow. Like, right. Those like, two things I, are, are d- opposed to me, but I like it. Yeah. Exactly. And the, it's just like there's seasons for things like winery tours are mainly in like the fall, but the NASCAR stuff's in the summer and the lake stuff's in the summer. And so like I've got my two heavy seasons, and but I've got these traffic drivers, right? And I think a lot of people in 2020 and 2021 and like kind of like that 2020, 2022 range, were just buying properties and markets where they weren't really looking for those traffic drivers and those things. And then once COVID's over, people stop traveling there or they see a massive dip in travel. So we always want to have those kind of things that are growing and developing in different markets. And that's a huge indication of like long-term growth, not just short-term. Yeah. And I think there there are those markets that perform well in both weathers. Like I look at Vermont, Vermont has skiing in the winter, but then it's like super nice, you know, in the summer yeah. and spring, you can walk around, go to the parks. But I think that's an important dynamic as well to just understand who's coming to your property and when, because the skiers, they're not coming back for that, that summer, unless they also just happen to like Vermont. Cause I used to do it in the Hamptons like about 20 years ago. And we knew we would make all the money in the summer. And then off season, we would just do whatever we want. We would go there when we want, we would send our friends. And then sometimes we would six months rent the place if we weren't going to go, because we understood the dynamics that we would just clean up during the summer. And that's that can still be done in those very, very summer friendly vacation markets, like in Cape Cod and things like that. People clean up in the summer, it gives you a lot of leeway in the off time to figure out, you know, you you can do what you want. Right. And a lot of people a lot of investors I talk to who are trying to transition from long term to potentially short term, they're like, well, I want something more year round. And I'm like, well, that doesn't really exist in a good yeah. vacation market. It, there's going to be seasonality. Right. And I always ask them, do you want seasonal or like, do you want monthly returns? Do you care about monthly returns or are you more focused on yearly yeah. returns? Right. Because the yearly returns are what I'm after. So if I have to float some costs, and the, the, the income fluctuates, but I know that and I know it's expected. I don't care as long as the property makes money on a yearly basis. Yeah, but also think about that. Your annual income in a vacation area is going to be X and say your annual income in a non-vacation. If they matched up and the amounts were the same, you'd have less wear and tear, though, in the vacation because you're going to have right. lower occupancy in the off season, but higher a higher occupancy in the summer at a higher value. So you're Correct. getting less wear and tear on your property, which is you know, the thing that eventually makes you spend more money, you put in all the nice furniture, and then you realize, well, it should have been more durable, shouldn't have gone with that couch. You know, these are things that I think people really need to understand, because we are talking about data, of course, and identifying the market. But then there's still now the hospitality part that we talked about furnishing upkeep management, that's all Mm -hmm. one big if this is not for amateurs, in my opinion, I think that, you know, like a lot of hedge fundy types bought short term rentals, but I think the mom and pops of us can now beat them because we can give them personality. And mm-hmm. the properties you see with these like amazing game rooms and all these things, they're never going to stop making money because it's so much better than a hotel. Right. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I absolutely agree with all of that. If you look across now, 2024, are there markets that you think are really ripe for short term rentals that maybe people don't identify as, you know, ones at the top of all these millions of lists that are made all the time? Yes. Well, I have my own list. So I don't know if that counts as part of all the lists. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, a lot of the markets. So I talk to a lot of people about emerging markets. And I look for the signs of emerging markets, meaning growth and uh, kind of this like, you know, emergence of revenue for these type of properties. Because the fact of the matter is there are actually quite a few markets across the country that are emerging, whether that's, you know, new ski resorts going in, amusement parks, theme parks being announced or being built, you know, different things like uh, colleges or universities expanding, businesses coming in, uh, all these like where a main traffic driver, you know, like for example, uh, this one's a little bit uh, debatable, but it's a good, a good, it's a good example. Universal Studios is building in North Texas. And there's rumors now, I don't even know if I should say this, but there's rumors that possibly Disney is talking about that too. I mean, that would just 
boom, that that would yeah. be another huge mark. That'd be the next Orlando. You know what I mean? Right. Like yeah. that kind of stuff we're constantly researching, but also on a smaller level too. We're looking at, we're noticed Vail Ski Resorts, a massive ski resort company. They're buying up ski resorts in the Northeast and they're making them huge and bigger and better. And it's like, no one's talking about that. And when you look at these places up there, these short-term rentals, they're like mom and pop shops that people yeah. really haven't known about. They're tiny, they're out of date, but they're making a ton of money and they're just about <laughs> to, well, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, that's the kind of stuff we're really looking for in the markets. And they're, they're all across the country, all across yeah. the country. Yeah, those are great points. I mean, I liken that to your traditional rental markets or just home sale markets when you're looking at places where Starbucks and Whole Foods and Trader Joe's are planting their flags. You know, property values are going to go up. What you're saying directly applies to short term, new things coming in that are going to drive an excess of traffic. For me, if I heard that, even if it was a rumor, it's like the prices to get one in North Texas, not that bad. So if you Mm -hmm. had your bets on one that does okay, and then you could you know, it could explode. Those are good. I think, I think Amazon a few years ago was going to move to Lakeland and in Florida. And then that adjusted to what a lot of people wanted to do around the area. Florida has been SDR heavy for, for a long time. Right. Right. Now I don't, I won't make moves on a property or, or tell people to go to a market until, you know, like for the example, the universal one, it was like, we, you know, we kept our ear to the ground. I was like, when they break ground, that's right. when things are serious. You know, when yeah. they announce something, it's like, hey, 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 whatever. Like, it's going to take them years to build something. So it's the same thing with, you know, even the ski resorts. They announce, say, okay, great. What are you going to do with it? What's your plan? You know, and then yeah. we'll and kind of you don't turn a, a ski resort from mom and pop to, you know, the, the biggest of the big in just like a season. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And so I, I look for like one of the ones I'm thinking is Newry. So Sunday River, it's going to be one of the biggest in the Northeast. They, there's, uh, I don't think it was Vail. It might have been Vail. Some, someone bought it in 2019 or 2018. They're dumping in 220 million dollars over a 10 year period, and they spent over half of that in, in, in like through the first three years. And this thing is huge yeah. now, you know. And, and there's tons. There's a lot of people going to it, and there's virtually like no short term rentals in that market now. This year, there's there's a lot more since it's kind of word's been out. But yeah, um, I mean, it was one of those things where it's like. It's like, whoa, like there's opportunity here. There's like no hotels. You know, like there's the growth, and it's and no hotels isn't necessarily a, a, a you know a bad thing. It's just because of the the um, amount of investment in the growth that this thing has seen in just a few years is like they got to catch up to it. The infrastructure of the town and everything has to catch up as well. And so to be on the forefront of that is where you where you get the you can maximize some serious returns. Yeah. And I think it even increases the kind of diameter of where people are willing to drive to. There may be towns that are nearby that, you know, the next town over where you could get a property for 50 percent less where someone who maybe it's not going to be for everyone because they want to be close to the slopes. But maybe there is that subset or like, I mean, I don't mind saving half the money to, you know, to drive and you save half the money on the buy in there. Yep. I agree. That's one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, the best deals aren't the ones in these markets that everybody talks about. It's not where the herd is, you know, yeah. on social media or in the, the blogs. It's these places where that are growing and expanding that, you know, there, there's an element of risk to it. But if you're yeah. experienced and you know how to run your numbers and you understand what's going on, there's some opportunity. Yeah. And if you go back to what you said in the beginning, I mean, what's your worst case scenario? OK, you, it doesn't work as a short term rental and you long term rent it. Right. Do you agree that everyone who's doing short term rentals should be running the numbers as a long term rental so they have that fallback position and they understand what it is? Um, huh, That's yeah, that's a risk. That's a really heavy risk question. And I have that with a lot of my clients. The problem is. So let's take an example. Let's say you buy a $1.5 million property. I don't know what world a single family home at 1.5 million is going to make sense from a long-term rental. From a short-term rental perspective, it can make a lot of sense. And so I think that's, that's a a risk thing where it's like, look, this has got to work as a vacation, but the traffic drivers have to be there. They have to be established for me, you know, if, if I'm going to be in that situation. So I do agree with that. But at the same time, I'm also like, well, it doesn't necessarily apply for, for everywhere. And, and I think yeah. it's market dependent. And in those, like you're talking about, it's really like a 
oh, an oh, oh shit scenario. You know, like yeah. we really thought it was going to do well. We got like bed bugs or something. Now we really have to pivot to something else for a while to to clean it up. But yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think everyone should be looking at multiple exit strategies just because I feel like people, if you're brand new and you haven't done short-term rentals and you get super hopped up on it and you're like, I'm going to make, you know, 85,000, that's what yeah. the numbers say. And you don't even furnish the place. Well, you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot and then they're going to come back and like, Oh, well, Kenny said this market was going to be good. <laughs> and you, you know, you look at their rental and you're like, it looks terrible. You know, your descriptions, right. four lines, you're, you're not following all the steps. And that's where I think, you know, you have a company, obviously, that's running the data, but people have to be participatory in all the things that go into it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, there's so many different things that go into making it a success. But I really do think it definitely starts with data, understanding the neighborhoods. And like you said, in your top five tips, knowing how many other Airbnbs are in the area, short term rentals is going to be huge for you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think saturation, it's kind of been the sexy term thrown around recently. Oh, the market's saturated. This is saturated. Yeah. And the, the, the problem with that thinking, though, is saturation is never truly on a market level, right? Because demand isn't on a market level. It's on a property or a, a size level, right? Like, when you travel, are you travel? Who are you traveling with? What kind of property size are you looking for? Those group sizes will vary based on bedroom counts. I did. I have a video of this on you on YouTube about Orlando. Where I'm like, look, we take a three bedroom, and we take a ten bedroom, okay, and we measure the saturation using the total revenue in a given month divided by the yeah. number of short-term rentals year over year. And we compare that, and we see that three bedrooms are like way oversaturated, and 10 bedrooms are not saturated at all. There's actually over demand and not, not enough supply. So that's one of those things like when we're, we can look at these things in the market and really determine like, okay, what's true saturation levels and what, what can I do to be unique or what I call building a moat to separate yeah. me from everybody else. Yeah. And that I, right. I do think in, if you take the quoted term saturation, it probably fit just because there were more operators than we needed in the yeah. market. But like you're saying, the top properties could care less about saturation. It makes no difference. They know right. what they're doing. They're running a separate business that has nothing to do with, you know, brand new operators coming in with with very low grade, you know, rental opportunities there. Do you think when, when people were doing last year in the middle of last year saying, oh, STR is dead, <laughs> what did you think of that? New, you know, you're looking at the data all day. Why were people saying that? Because all of us were saying, of course, it's not true. Yeah. So there's, you know, the squeeze of the market, right? So we're, we're even seeing this like in the economy today. So really the middle is being squeezed, meaning like, or, you know, even a separated. So what I'm seeing is like in the data is that the top properties are making more money. Yeah. The, bot, the average is making less money. And we're having this growing divide, right? Like we're seeing this even, even like even with restaurants. Like you're seeing the the chilies, the Applebee's, like a lot of these ones going out of business for the middle yeah. class. And people are either getting poorer or they're getting richer, you know, and the, the middle is getting smaller. And so there's this growing divide, even in short-term rentals. And so, you know, my portfolio, even over 2022 and 2021, is up. Why is that? It's because of my property, the strategies and the tips I you know, employ. There's a lot more competition in my market. I have to be a lot more aggressive. But what I'm doing to stay ahead, that like, I, you know, and, and so the average, the people who aren't planning, they think they can set it and forget it. They're yeah. the ones who complain. And that's who you hear. Yeah, so. I, I completely agree. And I'm so glad you said that. It, it reminded me of the hedge funds who got into flipping and all of these iBuyers and stuff. They were just turning out terrible flips. And sure, when the market was insane, they were doing well. And then people were like, you know, these flips suck. <laughs> <laughs> just like the average short term rental, you know, right. I, I, the, just on a side, have you ever have you ever had to show up at a short term rental and then reject it? It's only happened to me twice. My sister and I have really stayed at them for 20 years. We probably stayed at, you know, more than 100. And only twice did you know, like kind of like a, a internet dating thing, like the pictures didn't match the property when we got right. there. Has that happened to you? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I've had to, it, it, it's as, especially as a, as a host, I get a little more pickier before yeah. I was like, Oh, I'm just going to get like, you know, a nice cheap place, like affordable place. Now it's like, I have to stay in nicer places or I'll really start to complain. I've noticed yeah. that. So, 
<laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, that, that's just me. But yeah, I've had that happen where I'm like, yeah, no, we're not staying here. I just walk out the door and leave. <laughs> yeah, so. I did. We did. We, uh, what, well, what's the best metric for just a regular consumer who wants to do short term rental? Should they be looking at reviews as number one or should they be looking at the host? What's the best metric to gauge if you're just re- someone regular, you just go on Airbnb, you want to go away for the weekend? What's the best way for them not to get into the blunder that we've both experienced? Because it really sucks. You show up and there might not be another place to go. Right. No, it, it's true. It's true. I would definitely say like, number one, you want to make sure they're a super host. I think it's an obvious one. But 47% of all hosts are super hosts on Airbnb. So it almost doesn't mean anything. That's more than I thought. That seems oh, ridiculous. It, it is. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how many have that stupid little badge now. It says guest favorite. Yeah. But pretty sure it's going to be like maybe 40%. But huh. anyway, yeah. so 40 for. 47% are super hosts. So that'll eliminate half the garbage out there. And then um, the biggest thing for me is, is seeing reviews, but number of reviews as well. So I like to see like over 20. They don't have to have a perfect five star, but yeah. I, you know, five Oh, they need to have like, you know, like I need to look through there. I'll look through them and see what people are saying, you know, what they me like, too. What they don't like sometimes if you want to be really efficient, here's a cool little trick you can do. You can copy all the reviews and put them into chat GPT and tell chat GPT to summarize and tell you what do people like about the place and what they (laughs) hate hate about the place. And it will tell you in like less than a minute. (laughs) And there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've upgraded that for a couple of sites. Now they have it like in the top, I think on Yelp, they have like a AI summary, you know, of Mm, what everybody's saying as part of it. Those are good tips though, because I feel like as a consumer, you really don't want to make the mistake, but sometimes you see that flashy one. Everyone does have to have one review at some point. I actually look at the dates of the reviews. And if I see two or three that all have very close to dates, I think they're fake. You know, someone could, you know, just do their review late. It could happen. But if you have three or four within like a week, there's, there's some, there's probably something wrong there, you know, unless if you can see length of their stay too. Because I read the reviews too, because I feel like you can tell who's real in the reviews, especially if they say like, oh, well, you know, we were missing toilet paper, but the owner responded right away. That's, that's a great sign because then, you know, at least they're taking care of the property if, if something were to come up. Yeah. There's like the, the, the pro yeah. And you see like pros and cons or whatever. And then, yeah. So that, that, those are, those are very helpful. And it, I mean, it will prompt you to ask questions like, Hey, you know, is it, you know, is there going to be toilet paper? <laughs> I had yeah. to worry about that. So, yeah. which I had to worry about that at one of the Airbnbs. I was like, really is that? And they're like, well, you know, the, yeah, they just made some sort of excuse. And I was like, look, that's, that's not a thing these days. Like yeah. that's normal. You know, like yeah. if I go stay at a hotel, they have toilet paper. Like I don't have to go out and buy my own toilet paper. Right. You know? right. Like, yeah. So. But I mean, I, I, I don't know what, what, what you think about this, but I find the most complaints are about kitchen things or obviously pests, but like, it's just like the random things. I always bring up colanders because I think it's crazy because people are just like, how many, how much pasta are you making that you need more than one colander at a short term rental? But someone will complain. You know, there weren't there weren't seven steak knives. Well, I mean, it's a two bedroom. How many people need yeah, steak knives? How many people do you, yeah. you know, put them in the dishwasher. But that, right. that but understanding that as part of knowing what you're getting into, like you said before, with with short term rentals, you know, your long term renters are going to complain up front and then you're going to fix it and it's going to be fine. But the short term renters never stop. So unless yep. you keep improving your property and listening to the feedback that you get and acting on it. You're going to eventually, you know, soak yourself out of the market. I think you will end up with that, uh, you know, where you hide the bodies listing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Soak yourself. And I, I think it'll, the biggest thing that I see from a lot of people is just burnout. Yeah. So just tired of dealing with the guests, you know, in terms of the complaints. But if you have, that's why you got to set yourself up right from the beginning, right? Yeah. If you buy a property and you're not going to invest into it and make it what it needs to be then the reality is you're going to end up, you're going to deal with a lot of these things. Like I talk about, it's not just about having a down payment and closing costs by a short-term rental. You need to have funds for probably a little bit of renovation, yeah. furnishings. I There is not, a, I bought, this is one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. I bought a seven bedroom lake house, it came fully furnished. And I was like, sweet. My furnishing budget is going to be like maybe $10,000. I'm yeah. good to go. Walked into that house and looked at all the furnishings and was like, crap, I'll I have, have to, to get go, rid of yeah. every <laughs> single piece. It sucks. All yeah. of it. And the yeah. reality is like, sure, we kept some things, but we had to get rid of so much. And that took a lot of time where I could have just like, I if I wish I had a blank slate. I should have told him like, nope, we're not taking, we're not taking your crap. Like you got to yeah. get rid of it. 
or I could have just posted on Facebook, free furniture, take whatever you want in the house. Yeah. You know? And anyway, that that took a few weeks to get rid of everything yeah. to figure out how to buy a dumpster. But the reality is like you gotta you gotta save for furnishings and then amenities, you know, for sure. hot tubs, saunas, game rooms, EV chargers, all this stuff. Like th- these are the things that are gonna be expected in short term rentals. So if you're yeah. not gonna live up to that, you know, that expectation, then probably isn't the right industry or right type of play for you right now. Yeah, you just dropped a few of them, but what do you think the top three amenities are that you see across the board that are just helping people make more money? Okay, so yeah, keep in mind amenities vary market to market, right? So like a yeah. hot tub isn't as impactful in a beach market as, in, as it is in a <laughs> Yeah, a Joshua tree, you really don't need a hot tub. It's like 120. Yeah, you just need a body of water. <laughs> yeah, cool yeah. Water yeah. you need a cold go. plunge at all times. Yeah, yeah. A cold pl- yeah there you go, yeah. like that cold plunge. So my tips are... When it comes to amenities, the reality is like, yeah, sure, hot tub, you know, game rooms are really good. Like there, there's some just like generic ones that are great. But the reality is how you market your amenities is actually how you make your money. So mm. when we look at the data and, you know, maybe I can show you this in an office or whatever, like actual yeah. real time in a sheet. But we look at the data and we look at properties that have a particular amenity and their revenue and properties that don't and have that revenue there's a range, right? There's always going to be a range of, you know, the revenue, the ranges overlap with each other. And you'll see, it'll look like kind of like this, where I'm like, you know, like the, the ones without the, they're making a little bit less, but there's some that are making the same, if not a little more than properties that do have that particular amenity. And then obviously there's properties without amenity that make more altogether. Yeah. And so, but why is that? And when we look at those properties that had the amenity, but made less than properties that didn't have that amenity, we noticed that they weren't marketing the amenity. Yeah. They weren't showing yeah. the photos of that amenity. For example, a hot tub. Like if you take a picture of a hot tub with its cover on versus <laughs> yeah. the picture of a hot tub with the cover off and like, you know, like the water going and maybe even somebody in People, the hot tub. I agree. I, yeah. I, I've, I've seen experience photography be more and more relevant. See, you know, if you have a fire pit, people around the fire pit and not user generated, of course, they're going to post their own photos. But creating that kind of curated lifestyle photography, I think dramatically is helping because you can see it and you're like, oh, that could be me. I could be in that hot tub. That that looks better than just the water looks good, but it looks better when people are in it having fun. Properties that use experience photography, I did I did a, re, a recent study on this. Most of those properties are in the 90th percentile for revenue yeah. in the markets. Now, there's some other correlations to that, right? So like they're going to be naturally better hosts. They're yeah. going to have better quality of the property and things like that. Like it's just going to be a better property all around. But their revenue is naturally higher. And I've seen it where they probably shouldn't be performing as well as they are compared to everybody else, but they are because of the photos yeah. as an element. So yeah. it's definitely a revenue generator to do that as well. So going back to answering your question, when it comes to amenities, sure, there's a ton of great amenities you can add, but how you market them and the photos you take is the most important thing you can do to increase your yeah. revenue. So. I mean, this was a phenomenal show. You've dropped so many nuggets for people. Good. Where is the best place? Is So one, they can go to STR Insights. That your site, that's your site that you created and spend so much time at. And is that the best place to find you too? I think Instagram is, that has an STR Insights as well. Yeah, Instagram. Or you can just follow me at Kenny Bedwell. I drop a ton of just nuggets, reels, things like that. I talk about amenities a ton. Yeah. Or finding deals, all kinds of good stuff on there. You can watch. Yeah, follow me there. Awesome. Well, it was a pleasure. I'm glad I had you on. I really, this is a replay episode. If you want to do short term rentals, just rerun it, listen to it again. There's a lot of (laughs) tips and tricks in here that Kenny gave us. So I really appreciate you spending the time, man. Yep. Thanks, Jonathan. Glad to, I was glad to be invited. Thanks for having me on. All right. That was Kenny Bedwell. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends. 
and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. <laughs>